Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Margaret Anderson, and I am a policy associate at JPAL Global, where I manage the Jobs and Opportunity Initiative. It is our pleasure to host this event along with our colleagues of JPAL's Gender and Economic Agency Initiative. For those who may not be familiar, JPAL is a research center based at the Economics Department at MIT. We work with a network of researchers who use randomized evaluations to evaluate the impact of social programs around the world. We also host research initiatives that fund rigorous policy relevant research to determine what works in addressing key challenges around a given topic. In the case of the Jobs and Opportunity Initiative, that strategies to improve employment outcomes. For the Gender and Economic Agency Initiative, it's strategies to enhance women's economic agency. Joy Kiru, senior lecturer at the University of Nairobi and part-time policy and research advisor at JPAL, will moderate today's webinar, and I will hand it over to Joy to introduce the topic and our panelists shortly. Before doing so, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping notes. We will start with presentations from our moderator and each panelist, then open the floor to questions from the audience. If you'd like to ask a question during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function and share your name and affiliation if you're comfortable so our panelists know who the question is coming from. Feel free to ask questions throughout, but we likely will not answer them until the end. We may not be able to answer all questions and apologize in advance. Over to you, Joy. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, Margaret. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. We are gathered here today to discuss a very topical issue, the issue of economic impacts of COVID and the impacts that it has had on livelihoods. We begin by noting that the world economy contracted by about 4.5 percentage points, and that's about 3.94 trillion US dollars. Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, contracted by two, two, two percentage points. Kenya, for example, has lost about 5.6 billion US dollars due to COVID. The implications on these economic contractions are immense. For example, picture this. Before COVID, about 80% of all employment in Kenya was through the informal, informal sector. A recent survey in 2020 showed that about 90% of employment in Kenya was now through the informal sector, implying that more people had exited, had exited informal employment into had exited formal employment into informal employment. Even in the best of times, the informal sector faces many challenges that impact negatively on its productivity. The sector is also dominated by women. Indeed, about 88% of all informal enterprises in Kenya are owned by women. After the first wave of COVID pandemic, we saw phased out reopening of, economic, of economies around the world. And this ignited a lot of hope for economic recovery. Then we saw a second and now a third wave in some countries. Government reverted to more economic restrictions. For example, the government of Kenya recently put Nairobi and adjacent counties into new lockdown. This has imposed strict social distancing measures and further frustrating the enterprises that had barely struggled to reopen. As we speak now, Nairobi is under lockdown. The economic impacts of this is immense and people are, are facing difficult challenges, especially during these times. For example, a study, showed, a, a study has shown that uh, 67 of smallholder farmers in Kenya are struggling to meet their day-to-day -day basic needs due to the disrupted supply chains. And there are about 20 million new urban poor due to COVID. Today, we have with us two researchers who have done some work around the impacts of cash grants on informal women-owned enterprises in Kenya. They'll be sharing that research with us. We also have with us today representatives from google.org who will discuss their experiences in supporting underserved communities around the world. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. The first speaker is Jacqueline Arindi. Dr. Jacqueline Arindi is a Regional Research Program Manager at the University of Notre Dame Ford Program and is a postdoctoral research fellow at Strathmore University Business School. Jacqueline, the floor is yours.
You are muted, Jacqueline. You are muted. Sorry, <laughs> common mistake. Thank you, Joy, for the introduction. Um, as Joy has said, I'm going to be presenting on the implementation of cash transfers as a response to COVID-19, a randomized experiment in Kenya. My role as regional research programs manager is to implement research on behalf of faculty for the University of Notre Dame. So I'll be giving a brief um, presentation on how we implemented uh, the research using this PowerPoint. So just a little bit about the Ford Family Program. So the Ford Family Program is housed at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies at the University of Notre Dame and has been operating in Kenya since 2011. And our key goal is to conduct and support research focused on understanding people's own capabilities. And this research is um, supported to encourage sustainable solutions for the people to have solutions to their own problems and through community engagement. Our key partner in Dandora is the Holy Cross congregation that has a Catholic presence, but welcomes people from all over the place. And the research agenda arose from community engagement, where the community said that they wanted support on how to help their businesses grow and possible interventions. So that's about the Ford program. We did the research in Dandora. Dandora is in the east side of Nairobi city. Its population is 110,000 um, people in an, a land area of only four square meters. So it's quite densely population populated and the garbage dump for Nairobi is situated in Dandora. I did not want to share pictures. You can Google for yourself. Uh, and several small businesses um, operate within uh, Dandora. And as Joy said, the businesses in this informal sector are dominated, owned and operated by women micro entrepreneurs. Um, and they use these businesses as a, a way of um, keeping their livelihood. So these are uh, examples of some of the businesses. We got permission from the people in the picture to show the pictures, they signed a release. And these are some of the entrepreneurs and the scale of business that we are talking about that were surveyed. So quickly to the RCT implementation. So um, the RCT, the randomized control trial we were doing was part of an existing cross-sectional survey of 4,500 female-run micro-enterprises. And we were looking at an earlier study where we were looking at the impact of mentoring. So earlier on, Wyatt et al. had done a study that compared classroom teaching and mentoring. And so there was an ongoing study happening. And so we pivoted during COVID to study the importance of a one-time cash transfer um, in response to the expected economic downturn that was going to come with COVID. So we targeted businesses that were really small and most of them are retail pharmacies such as what you've seen, vegetable shops and shops that do their own production of shoes or, or, or certain goods. So for this study, 800 women were selected 753 were successfully enrolled, and then they were divided into the treatment and control with 367 going to the treatment and 386 acting as the control. And then the intervention was a cash grant equivalent to one month's average profit, which is approximately 5,000 Kenya shillings, which is about $50 thereabout. And the control group just got 500 shillings for their time. The cash was delivered by M-Pesa, which most of the people have mobile phones, and most of them are enrolled in um, have the M-Pesa app. And all surveys were done Actually, by phone. Do you have any slides? Sorry to disturb you. Are you sharing any slides? We cannot yes. see your, your screen. Oh, we really? cannot see your screen. No, we can't. Maybe you could share again. I'll let you know when you start seeing your slides. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. Can you see my slides now? Not yet. We're just seeing you. Oh, we got oh screen so share. Let me share screen. Let me then share my can... screen. Oh my goodness! I assumed the whole while that I was sharing my slides and moving. Sorry, I just saw that. Apologies. Uh, now you apologies. Are. Okay. Sorry, this was the Ford program slide. I'm very sorry for that. No just worries. 
yeah, let me just go to the picture to show you. I just want to make this. Uh... So you're able to see my slides now? Yes, Jacqueline, I'm sure others can see them too. Let us know if you cannot see the slides, but I can see them from my end. Thank you. Okay, I'm very, very sorry about that. I was going through. So these are examples of the small businesses that we work with in, uh, in Dandora. And so I was talking about the RCT implementation and I'd walked through that it was part of an existing study and um, the intervention was delivered via M-Pesa and all the surveys were done by phone and we did them between the months of May and August. So every month we had a number of surveys going on. We contacted each person around four times and if we didn't get a response, then we re randomized the list to avoid bias from the same people so that the, the order would be different. So this is the timeline. And you can see the COVID cases in Kenya started in March 2020. And then the major government responses were between March and April. So this is the first lockdown and the first curfew that was at 7 p.m. And then you can see at around the beginning of May, we started doing our surveys all the way through to August. And January is the original baseline uh, study, which we were able to, to do. So what are some of the challenges and success factors that we had and some of the impact on the businesses? So the women mentioned um, our, our team got some challenges using phones as a survey. As much as we were using phones even from January, there was the issue of charging. Of course, certain phones sometimes are not charged and getting to the people was sometimes very difficult. So we used to call them in the evening. Then there's lots to follow up. Some of the respondents as a coping mechanism moved up country. In Kenya, there's the village side. So they were able to move out up country as a coping mechanism. So people are moving back and forth after the first opening. Those are reopening between March and May. So some people had moved up country when the lockdown happened. Then as the pandemic increased in size, a lot of the people who were surveying, some of the people said they have, they got COVID themselves and their friends and relatives also got COVID. And so they had to go for funerals and this disrupted some of their business activities. Then of course the government directives such as the curfews and the lockdowns and the reduced hours for businesses left women vulnerable to closing their businesses because by seven you had to close. And so by six, if somebody was moved traveling within even Dandora, you had to release your workers early. And so these government directives affected some of the businesses. And then of course there's food insecurity. Some of the people said they use the money to buy food instead of doing their businesses. Then there's also disrupted and closed markets. So the government hosts certain markets within Dandora and they reported that some of those were closed and so you couldn't put your wares. So we had a bit of some of those challenges. And some of the success factors that we had was, um, we called the respondents at least four times as we mentioned, and mostly in the evenings because they would not pick their phone calls during the daytime because charging phones are expensive. So you find that people switch off their phones during the daytime when they go home so that they don't spend on power, they charge at home. Then we established earlier trust through our program, through our community engagement efforts. And we have a research office based outside the Holy Cross Parish in Dandora, which we work from, which has greatly assisted us to be able to follow up on respondents. Then we also have a, a community mobilizer who's an employee of the parish who works with us on research projects and greatly helps to follow up with people in the community because she knows them and lives with them and is often there to help. Then of course, we had referrals of women patients. We have a hospital on the grounds of the hospital or on the grounds of the parish where people who had gotten COVID-19 were referred for treatment. So we kind of had an inbuilt uh, system to, to help with some of the challenges that were happening on the ground. I'll conclude by talking about possible government support. The people in Dandora reported that they received no government support during the COVID. 
2019 period and none of the NGO support. But in our other studies, we know that there are other social protections such as the free maternity services that are that is implemented by the National Health Insurance Fund. And they give flexible amount. They give an amount 500 shillings. They tell respondents to pay 500 shillings, which had been affordable earlier. But now with the economic downturn, we believe that that's a very small amount and they should be flexible and allow for irregular contribution, you know, different uh, amounts over a period of time because uh, they need to base it on informal workers' ability. So there's potential for government to provide support for such existing, um, using such existing functions. Then what we've seen that also works is leveraging on existing community structures such as in our case, the parish. The parish is a Catholic parish, but it's open to people from everywhere. And we are able to contact and communicate with people and allow for traceability and information dissemination on the cash um, transfer program. So I'll end there and I'll hand over to my colleague, Dr. Wyatt Brooks, who will give you the, the mechanics of the study and the results of the study. Thank you. I'm sorry about the slides, I'm very sorry. No worries, Jacqueline White, you've been introduced by Jackie. White is an associate professor at the, at the WP Curry School at the University of Arizona. Welcome. The floor is yours, White. Thanks, and uh, thanks everyone for your interest and for uh, being here. And I should say good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. It's quite early here in Arizona. Um, so uh, I'm Wyatt Brooks. Uh, I'm uh, uh, at Arizona State University. Um, and uh, this research, as Jackie mentioned, is funded uh, just uh, not just by uh, JPAL under the Jobs and Opportunity Initiative, but also by the uh, Ford Family Program in Human Development Studies and Solidarity at uh, the University of Notre Dame. And in addition to me and Jackie, who you just heard from, uh, the other authors on this project are Kevin Donovan at Yale and Terrence Johnson at uh, the University of Virginia. Uh, so I just wanted to start by giving a little background on uh, sort of the context for this project, uh, building off of what Jackie was saying, and then uh, I'll go into uh, the uh, design of the project and the results that we saw. So it's important to keep in mind that with COVID-19, uh, there's been a large variety of responses uh, by countries around the world. Um, but according to uh, Gentilini and co-authors at uh, the World Bank, um, at this point, over 150 countries around the world have created more than 200 new cash transfer programs uh, directly in response to COVID-19. So there are many, many uh, new cash transfer programs that are coming online just in the last year uh, because of this problem. Uh, these interventions come in a wide variety of forms. Uh, so they can be transfers to different segments of the population, obviously in different amounts and with different conditionalities. Uh, but uh, in general, these cash transfers have become ubiquitous. The basic rationale is that the pandemic requires the government to put restrictions in place, restrictions on movement, which turn out to be restrictions on work. Um, and these restrictions suppress the ability of people to maintain their usual livelihoods. Uh, as we know, uh, and as Joy mentioned, the, there's a very high degree of informality in labor markets in many parts of the world, and particularly in developing countries. Uh, and informal businesses we would expect would be uh, disproportionately impacted by these restrictions. So the idea of these programs is that some funding is needed to allow people to get through this period um, in order to maintain their livelihoods. So there's, on the academic side, there's a very large literature on cash transfer programs in general in a variety of contexts and looking at a variety of outcomes. Um, however, for this very specific thing that's been happening with COVID-19, which is cash transfers created directly in response to a pandemic, uh, there's very little existing work. Obviously in the last year, there's been uh, new existing work that's, um, sorry, there's been new work that's been, uh, that's been done, uh, but so far there hasn't been uh, much to guide us on these issues. So the setting is unusual when we're looking at a pandemic, most obviously because there's infection risk to individuals. So we would see that individual behavior should be changing uh, as they uh, are mitigating their own risk. 
Um, and likewise, there are heavy government restrictions in place that completely change how markets function. Uh, so in the United States, obviously, most of us can work from home. And so it might not be that much of a disruption to our livelihood. Uh, but in developing countries where uh, uh, retail operation in particular depends on in-person interaction, if in-person interaction is restricted, then those jobs or uh, business opportunities may disappear completely. So in this project, our goal was to directly study how cash transfers change behavior and outcomes for recipients. Uh, so we conducted a randomized control trial to evaluate the effects of an unconditional cash transfer uh, that we ourselves initiated in Dandora. Uh, and as Jackie mentioned, it's a very densely populated uh, urban slum in Nairobi. The statistic I like to use is that uh, uh, Dandora has um, about three quarters of the population density of Manhattan, but it doesn't have any buildings more than uh, five stories tall. So it's very dense. Um, the population we focus on are uh, female uh, owners of micro enterprises. Uh, and these are very small micro enterprises, as Jackie said, the vast majority of which have no employees. Um, and it's um, important to remember that self-employed as Joy was saying, are the majority of the workforce uh, in many developing countries, including Kenya, and uh, especially among women. So we think this population is particularly important uh, given that from other studies, we know that they uh, tend to have very low levels of savings. And so therefore, if they lose their income, they may not have any way of maintaining their livelihood. And moreover, since the vast majority of them are retailers, uh, they're dependent on interpersonal interaction uh, for the conduct of their business. So we think of this as being a group that's particularly at risk uh, from the pandemic and uh, likely to be affected by the associated mitigation measures. Uh, so the group that we're looking at uh, is drawn from the surveys that we were doing uh, in 2020 for a different project. Um, the timing worked out so that the uh, baseline period that we were doing where we were doing this broad-based survey to try to gather participants happened to end at the end of February in uh, 2020. Uh, which was just before the lockdowns began. And so we had this kind of pool of participants that we could draw on uh, when we were designing this new study to study cash transfers. So uh, in, in that case, uh, this project was uh, only possible because of uh, the luck of the timing that we had. Um, so this group that we were looking at of uh, female entrepreneurs was particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Um, from what we saw in January to April, uh, when the pandemic restrictions began to be put into place, average profits in that group declined by 50%. Um, and a lot of that, is, as Jackie was saying, was because of uh, business closure, uh, including some that uh, returned to their uh, uh, home regions. Um, but even among those that remained operating, uh, profits declined considerably. So our research uh, design selected 800 um, uh, participants, uh, we began sur surveying them in April of 2020, and we randomly selected half of them to receive a one-time uh, transfer of 5,000 shillings, about 50 US dollars, um, while the control group received 500 shillings, or about 5 US dollars, uh, to compensate for participating in the survey. Uh, treatment was assigned randomly, which allows us to interpret differences in outcomes between the two groups as the causal impact of getting that larger cash transfer uh, on the two participants, because of course the two groups were indistinguishable before the intervention. That's the, uh, the power of randomization. So all transfers were made via MPESA, of course, because we didn't want to, uh, we wanted to minimize uh, uh, in-person interaction. Um, and they were all completed by May 12th, um, which precedes the period of the sharpest rise in the number of cases in Kenya, as we saw in the slide that uh, Jackie showed us. Um, we then continued to survey participants by phone uh, continuously through the summer. So the idea was that um, we would do a round of surveys, try to meet, uh, contact every participant. And as soon as that round ended, we started the next round and continued uh, for the whole summer uh, until the middle of August. Uh, so uh, just to avoid repetition, I'm about to describe the results and all the results. Uh, technically, what I'm describing is uh, comparing the treatment group to the control group. Uh, with time fixed effects and standard errors clustered at the individual level. Um, and I, I'm only talking about the results that are statistically significant. And I should say that uh, the draft of the paper is available 
uh, on our websites and uh, you can feel free to look there for additional details. Uh, so our main finding is that the cash transfers were effective at meeting their goal of mitigating the economic damage of the pandemic. So I mentioned there was a 50% decline in profit um, from January to April and the cash transfer uh, made up about 20 percentage points of that. Um, so it helped reduce the impact of, on those businesses. Um, and among the changes in behavior that we saw, we saw a large increase in spending on inventory as well as on food expenditures. And just to emphasize, this is a 20 percentage point increase in business profits. Um, so that's in addition to the value of the cash grant itself. Uh, so um, th this is uh, uh, value to the business that uh, they've created in addition to that. So these results are due in large part to an increase in business activity. Business op businesses operated more hours and were open more days and a larger number of businesses um, that had uh, previous, previously shut down actually reopened in the treatment group compared to the control group. So this suggests that the cash actually made people uh, operate their businesses more intensely, which might be a concern from a public health perspective, because again, this is occurring at the peak of the first wave um, in uh, Kenya. So this is in effect sort of working against the government's efforts to reduce interpersonal interaction, since of course they're, these businesses are very small and mostly do their business in person. However, what we saw is that this, these potential public health risks were at least diminished uh, by the effects that we found of the cash transfer on uh, personal protective measures. So we found that the cash transfer caused an increase in spending on personal protective equipment, uh, such as face masks, soap, uh, and other uh, things that you would need to reduce the spread of the virus, as well as an increase in an index that we constructed of protective behaviors employed by the entrepreneurs to reduce the spread of the virus. Things like hand washing, mask wearing, uh, social distancing, um, and uh, accepting cash, uh, uh, um, uh, refusal to accept cash and go into fully electronic payment. Um, so uh, these effects were importantly not uniform across the, the population. We found that there was heterogeneity in these effects based on the subjective beliefs of participants about the seriousness of the virus. So in the baseline, we found that there was very wide uh, array of beliefs about how risky the virus was. Some believed it was no more risky than a common cold, and some thought that it was as deadly as Ebola. So, you know, a very high uh, probability of death condition on, on catching it. Uh, so what we did is we split the sample uh, according to their uh, baseline subjective belief about the risk, uh, and we compared those with uh, who believed it was highly risky to those that believed it was less risky. And what we found was that among the participants that believed that the mortality risk of COVID is not greater than the seasonal flu, uh, we found significantly smaller effects on all of these protective measures in that group. So whereas the, in, in fact, in that group, uh, the estimated effect on all those protective measures and spending on uh, protective equipment uh, was indistinguishable from zero. So what that tells us is that these beliefs are very important in the adoption of protective measures and that people may do more uh, to protect themselves and therefore protect the community uh, if they're convinced about the seriousness of the risk of the virus. Um, so just to summarize, what this tells us is that the cash transfer was successful in its economic goals of uh, maintaining livelihoods, uh, helping people uh, maintain their spending on food and maintain their businesses, uh, but that there was uh, this possible uh, unintended effect of them conducting their business more intently. This was offset by increases in protective measures, but the, the, the increase in protective measures depended on the beliefs about the participants and the seriousness of the risk. So what this tells us is that we believe that cash transfers are useful in this sort of a context at uh, mitigating the economic damage, but that it should be combined with some sort of a public information campaign to make sure that people understand the seriousness of the virus and will therefore choose to, uh, to uh, mitigate the risk to themselves in the community. So I'll stop there uh, and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, White. That was uh, quite a good presentation. Thank you very much for the good work. Our next speakers are Lisa Berisarova and Talimore, 
both from google.org. I think Lisa will go first. Lisa leads the economic opportunity portfolio at google.org in Europe and Middle East and Africa. And Talimore is a program manager at google.org where she manages the Sub-Saharan Africa portfolio. Lisa, the floor is yours now. Please feel welcome. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the kind invitation to take part in this event. So uh, my name is Lisa. Uh, I'm part of the google.org team. As has already been said, I lead our work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm also responsible for the economic opportunity, economic recovery work also in Europe and Middle East. Um, and uh, in the next couple of minutes, uh, Tamilore and I uh, will talk about our work uh, around cash assistance, specifically from the perspective uh, of a corporate uh, philanthropy and, and position our work in that context. Um, so to start with a few words about Google.org and who we are. So Google.org is Google's philanthropy. We have existed since the beginning of Google. And our core mission is to support underserved communities and provide opportunity for everyone. We do three key things, uh, funding, technology, and volunteering. So every year we direct 1% of Google's profits to support nonprofit organizations around the world. And our key goal is to support nonprofit uh, organization with innovation, taking informed risks, scaling their work, uh, and solving some of the critical challenges. And most importantly, help them support marginalized communities in the most efficient and strategic way. We also connect these organizations to leading Google technology experts. And finally, we match nonprofits with Google employees who want to volunteer their time and expertise. Um, alongside our work in our core portfolio, such as economic opportunity, racial equity, or digital responsibility, uh, to name a few, Google.org has supported cash assistance projects for almost a decade. We strongly believe in the efficacy of cash transfer interventions to reach communities that need it most, and particularly in the times of crisis. Uh, allowing families to use the money to meet their needs, uh, of course, not only providing critical support, but also helping to restore a very important sense of ownership. So um, our work around cash assistance has uh, two parts. Uh, on one side, we fund projects that put cash directly in the hands of the end beneficiaries. And we also support cash transfer project uh, with the expertise of Google volunteers who help design and facilitate platforms and partnerships to improve the mechanisms and research that actually make these projects work. Let me give you an example uh, of the work we did in 2018 with GiveDirectly that combined uh, the expertise of Googlers uh, with a philanthropic grant. So we gave uh, GiveDirectly $3 million to support large scale cash transfers to low income families in the US affected by natural disasters. And on the other hand, uh, we also uh, provided a team of four Google.org fellows who worked uh, full time to combine data on socioeconomic indicators and disaster damage into a single tool to help give directly better understand and support the people who are most in need. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, we tripled our funding to organizations who get cash directly into the hands of families and individuals in underserved communities. Through the work of our grantees, uh, 150,000 people received emergency cash assistance last year, with over 60% of those uh, being women. So that's a little snapshot of our cash assistance work uh, globally. Now I'd like to zoom into our work specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa. For a little bit of context, in 2017, our CEO Sundar Pichai made a 20 million commitment uh, in philanthropic, philanthropic funding to the region. Through this commitment, we chose to focus on supporting the informal sector and micro entrepreneurs with a focus specifically on women and young people in low income communities. And there were three foundational principles for our work. Uh, on one hand, uh, we know that uh, the best answers come from those who are closest to the challenge, closest to the community, who have ear to the ground. So this is why we prioritized 
hyperlocal organizations that have developed homegrown solutions in their communities um, to socioeconomic issues. So this has been very important for us and uh, Tamilor and I work a lot We're really finding and identifying uh, these local organizations who do excellent work. Uh, the second principle was long-term vision. We position our funding as a catalyst for initiatives that empower end beneficiaries to sustainably improve their economic, economic livelihoods in the long term. And finally, research, uh, understanding what methodologies work and making attempts, the first steps at streamlining data across the impact sector uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as part of this pillar, uh, we made a $4 million grant to JPAL to scale their work uh, across the continent with the focus on future of work and economic opportunity. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit uh, last year, uh, we knew that as a funder, we had to be agile in our approach and of course make adjustments to our strategy uh, about how we fund uh, nonprofit organizations and how we help organizations reach the end beneficiaries who ended up in uh, critical and complex situations. To support our grantees, we launched the local community grant program and we relaxed restrictions on things like milestone payments um, and transferred our funding into unrestricted operational costs to help organizations weather the storm and keep their staff. Uh, we also evaluated the best way to support the end beneficiaries. It was obvious very quickly how vulnerable groups were disproportionately affected, and particularly uh, women. It was mentioned by Jacqueline and Wyatt uh, about the devastating effects of the pandemic, particularly on women. I'll just highlight a few data points. In Kenya, for example, 60% of recorded job losses since the beginning of the pandemic are accounted to women. Um, and 90% of working women uh, across the African continent are engaged in the informal sector that has been particularly hardest hit as has uh, already been mentioned before. So we had to review our approach uh, focused on long-term impact, as I just mentioned, and find a new balance between providing safety nets today to those individuals um, with the view to create uh, infrastructure um, and a safety net for them to develop long-term solutions and thinking of the long-term uh, impact and the economic livelihoods. So uh, this reflection informed our uh, first large scale cash grants work uh, in Kenya. And I'll hand over now to Tamilori to, to talk more about this work. So over to you, Tammy. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Um, I'm happy to be here to share more about this work. Over the next few minutes, I'll be sharing specifically about our cash transfers work in Sub-Saharan Africa in a bit more detail. And then I'll also be sharing some of the insights that we've gleaned so far. Uh, so in responding to this challenge, the challenge that Lisa just described, we had a singular goal, supporting locally relevant organizations to reach those hit hardest by the pandemic. And to, to do this, we took two main steps. The first was to establish the how. So what approaches work best and what sorts of interventions had the potential to have the most impact? And the second thing was to answer the who, which were the right organizations with you know, the most direct access to end beneficiaries. We have already pinpointed you know, the vulnerabilities that women in Sub-Saharan Af Sub Africa face, why Jacqueline Lisa have already mentioned the data points that indicate this. But the question now was how to support these women. A UN woman, Women reports um, released in April specifically called out cash transfers as an efficient means to reach women in need. However, this didn't quite align with the strategic approach of our philanthropy in the region, which focuses on long term impact and empowering individuals with future proof skills. So this is how we decided to combine cash transfers with a training component. Having this, defined this strategic vision, it was time to move on to the second step, you know, who to work with. We turn to our existing grantee, Give Directly, who pioneered the direct cash movement in 2008, uh, with whom we've supported numerous projects over the years. In 2018, Give Directly Kenya were also winners of the Google.org Impact Challenge in Africa and received $125,000 contribution to a cash assistance pool targeted at over 1,000 urban youth in Kenya. As a result of that project, nearly half of cash transferred were invested in some form of income generating activity or education. We also decided to work with um, Shining Hope 
Shopko for Communities, also known as Shopko, because they had a very strong already existing women entrepreneurship program. We gave $1 million to give directly and Shopko to reach 500 women with approximately $1,200 split over five basic income transfers and two large um, lump sum payments. That $1,200 is about, I think, 85,000 Kenyan shillings. shillings. Um, so that's a brief overview of the, the project scope. And now I'd like to share some of the learnings and insights and um, so far. One key component of the project is to use operational data, recipient surveys, and qualitative interviews to generate evidence on the feasibility and effects of providing cash transfers to urban women. Give Directly is conducting monthly surveys and follow-up calls to collate the relevant data to produce that output. Give Directly and Shopco are about four months into the project right now, and I'd like to share some of the in insights that we've gleaned so far. About 200 of the women have reported spending their cash transfers to boost or expand existing businesses or start new businesses. A relatively small subset, between 5 to 8%, spent their transfers on basic family needs like debt repayments, household supplies, and medical bills. This is in direct contrast to the premise that larger transfer sizes are usually you know, used to catalyze new business investments, while smaller cash transfers are used to, to meet basic family needs. And we will continue to follow up on this because we see, we see this as really, really interesting um, insights in terms of the fact that these women are using these funds to invest in their businesses and grow their businesses. The second thing is that half of the group have spent their trans transfers on education for either themselves or others. And over 90% of participants have regularly attended the training component. It's especially encouraging to know that majority of the women are investing in funds to develop their skills or the skills of others around them. And it's also a testament to the wisdom of partnering with local, local organizations like Shopko who are closest to the need. Although the third wave of COVID-19 you know, has recently, well, not recently, I think they're on the down, downward tra trajectory now, um, but there are renewed restrictions on movement and gathering. And reflecting on these numbers and our overarching goal when we made the project, and when we put the grant together, it's great to see that our aim of supporting the women to counter the worst effects of COVID-19 um, and empowering them to invest and grow their businesses are on track. In addition to this, there are a couple more things that I'd like to highlight. We've seen, like White also mentioned, that cash transfers and their approach have expanded rapidly over the last year. And this rapid expansion has come with the need to adapt and refine existing models for efficiency and accuracy, depending on context, geographies, and demographics. Uh, and there are two things I'd like to call out, call out here. The first is the method of en enrollment. In light of COVID-19 restrictions, give directly needed to develop new enrollment methods and payment mechanisms. Um, and now they've moved to fully doing all the onboarding and outreach via SMS, as opposed to in-person the way they used to. And this has improved their cost efficiency and also the time it takes to send out the, the, the funding. The second thing is that there is a need to develop new methodologies uh, to zero in on the most vulnerable. A recent project in, in Togo supported by our AI team has developed a machine learning system using satellite imagery and mobile phone data to find citizens most in need in the country. All this macro data tells only one side of the story. So as I round up, um, I'd like to highlight the human scale of this work and tell you about Florence, a tailor in Matera, Nairobi, who is receiving cash transfers from Give Directly and business training from Shopko. Her husband lost his job during the pandemic and has since been unemployed. Florence has used the funds from transfers to purchase sewing equipment and start a clothes making enterprise. From this business, she's able to pay rent, pay, pay school fees um, and buy food. She's planning to get a bigger shop and get more equipment when she receives her lump, lump sum and is also hoping to um, train other tailors in her community. As a philanthropy, this is why we do what we do. You know, cash assistance initiatives give donors the fluidity to allow beneficiaries to respond creatively and autonomously to their challenges. And as we build on this work and navigate the cash transfer space um, in a bit to determine what works best and at scale, there are some questions that are, on our, that are on our mind. And I'll just mention three. So one of the questions is uh, scale versus depth. For instance, if skill training com comes at a lower cost as um, uh, cost per beneficiary than cash transfer, should we double down on skills training? Obviously, this is not the same in situations of crisis, which brings me to the second question. 
about the relevance of cash transfers beyond periods of crisis. How can they feed into longer term economic opportunity, upskilling and reskilling? And the final thing I'd like to highlight is, you know, the aspect of conditionality. Give directly employees a no strings attached unconditional cash transfer cash transfers model. Um, but you know, where the other the other models to explore, for instance, giving grants to SMBs to specifically grow their businesses. All in all, this sums up our thoughts and strategy on cash assistance and our support to women in underserved communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. I look forward to the rest of the conversation and the questions that will come um, come come our way. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand it back to Joy. A big thank you to all our speakers. I think you've taken us through the terrain of our. You've heard about research and policy implications, and you've heard something about uh, the actual putting all that research into practice and uh, the impact that it has had on livelihoods. We are now open for Q&A, and I'm going to take some questions from the chat. Um, the first question, I think, Tamilora, you tried to, uh, to answer that, that the, the role of cash transfers in a context of when there is no crisis, because we've been talking about a cash transfers in a context of crisis. I don't know if there's anything more you want to clarify on that, or you want to add something into your answer before I go to the next question. Yeah, I'm happy to add more there. I mean, to be honest, it's, it's, it's the question on our minds now as well in terms of, I don't think we have a final answer for that, but I think we've seen both contexts in terms of the one that I mentioned in 2018 and this one, and there is a trend where it's obvious that there is definitely people investing these funds into building their businesses. But again, I, I, yeah, probably also opening it to Lisa Wyatt or someone else who wants to share more about maybe there's some hard, hard figures or stats that you know can take that conversation forward. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, chime in as well. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a great question, um, uh, and I think one uh, if we're not looking at the situation of crisis or natural disaster, etc., um, we would probably consider looking at things like um, uh, loans, uh, low interest loans, or uh, grants to develop business ideas or uh, sort of having a slightly different methodology or having uh, conditional or restricted cash transfers, which are focused on growing businesses um, or improving or solving for certain challenges. So, which is very much in line with our kind of strategic philanthropy approach. Um, so this would be our kind of go-to uh, approach. However, um, as long as the, COVID-19 pandemic prevails, especially its impact on the economic livelihoods and the well-being of vulnerable people. Um, we will continue experimenting and, uh, and sort of going deeper into our work, especially in combining training and cash transfer. So once the impact of the pandemic or crisis dies down, uh, people would have used that time as well to uh, obtain skills which can help them grow their existing businesses, um, change their businesses, or, you know, improve their profits in, in different ways. Uh, this one, I'm going to pose the same question to Wyatt. For example, the research, you are a researcher. Do we have evidence on, on that, the role of cash transfers in times of non-crisis? And if you take that, you can also answer another question about uh, whether you observed any effects on digital on digital payments used during a research? It's a question like that in the Q&A section. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a very large academic literature on uh, the role of cash transfers in a variety of contexts. So uh, David McKenzie at the World Bank and others have um, looked specifically at entrepreneurs. And typically there, they found the results are positive that in fact, uh, a, a dollar in a cash transfer to an entrepreneur uh, returns more than a dollar uh, over time uh, as that business grows and, uh, and, and does quite well. So, um, and I think that result has been replicated in a variety of countries and a variety of contexts, though, you know, I, I think uh, obviously the rationale for this project was that the COVID context was so different that we, that we wanted to see how uh, the results differed here. Um, and then in addition to the effects on entrepreneurs, uh, Give Directly and others have done a lot of work on how households are affected 
uh, by cash transfers, what they spend the money on and so on. And I think the takeaway from that literature is that a dollar is worth more than a dollar in some sense, that if you give someone uh, cash that they, the, the, uh, the positive effects on their life is worth more than uh, just the straightforward effect of the transfer. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, as uh, Tamalora was saying, the, um, uh, there is this question of sort of uh, depth versus breadth. Like if I give someone a relatively large transfer, um, that can have a very big impact on that individual's life. But of course, that's quite expensive to do on a, on a wide scale. And so there's also been a lot of questions around, are there cheaper interventions that you can do that also have high impacts, but um, uh, high returns, but uh, uh, can be applied more broadly. Uh, so to uh, the second question around uh, digital transactions. Uh, yes, so uh, the good thing in Kenya is that M-Pesa is ubiquitous. Everyone has M-Pesa accounts and the vast majority of, um, of, entrepreneur, of entrepreneurs accept digital transactions. And then that in fact increased uh, during COVID. And in particular that in fact, a lot of businesses stopped accepting cash at all um, because of course cash can be a, a mechanism for transmission of the, the virus. Um, and so uh, we, we, in fact, saw that there was an increase in this behavior of uh, not just accepting uh, uh, digital transactions, but actually requiring them. Thank you very much, Ahead. The next one goes to Jacqueline. Someone is wondering, in your research, who was, how, who was giving the cash transfers? Your research, how probably, I, I think, I, I guess it's about uh, how you obtained and who, who was giving, I mean, what was the source of your cash transfer? Probably they are wondering who was behind that and how it was distributed. Thank you, Joy, for your question. So the cash transfers were being delivered from our office. So as Wyatt had mentioned earlier, we've had uh, studies that uh, look at entrepreneurship in Dandora before. And so we have a population of people that we've been working with. And so we were sending the money from our office. So myself and my team were doing the MPESA transfers and they know us um, from interacting in the community. So we were doing it and we got the funding from JPAL. I don't know if Wyatt has anything to add on. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So in this project, we weren't studying an existing program. This wasn't like a, a Kenyan government program or something like that. It was actually a program that we uh, designed and got funded in part by JPL and in part by the Ford Family Program at uh, Notre Dame. Um, and then the reason we were able to do the randomization is because we uh, were designing it and implementing it ourselves. Thank you very much. This is a question directed to Oni. Please explain a bit more the app that you use to identify the most needy people in communities. Please explain the app that you use to identify the most needy people in communities. Sorry, explain the what? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, the question is, um, explain about the app that you use to identify the most needy people in communities. That is, how do you select or how do you identify the needy or the vulnerable who you're going to be working with? Yeah, for this particular project, there wasn't any app that we used. Like I mentioned, we were working in uh, with Shofco, which is a local organization that works in informal settlements in Nairobi. So they already had a cohort of women within their women entrepreneurship program living within these informal settlements. And that's where the recruitment was done from. It wasn't an app. Um, I hope Thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Feel free to ask a follow-up question in case you need clarification. And then the next question goes to Wyatt. I think it's a technical question about how did you ensure that people were not profiling themselves to, to be selected for your program? How did you deal with selection bias? I think it's a technical question. Well, so the uh, selection criterion for the uh, program itself was based on, was from our baseline that we had done before COVID existed. It was just a broad-based uh, baseline of, uh, of um, businesses in Dandora uh, that we were doing for a different project. Um, and then from that data, we had contact information for the entrepreneurs, including their phone numbers. And so then we contacted them via phone and enrolled them that way. 
Um, and so uh, uh, our selection criterion didn't have any self-selection component. It was just based on their demographics. Um, and then it was randomization. And so um, uh, since, uh, <laughs> as is common in these types of programs, when uh, there's a cash transfer component, then take up is very high. And so we didn't have any systematic uh, uh, problems with people not taking up. Thank you very much. The next question will go to Lisa. Uh, to, to, to Lisa. Someone is wondering if they wanted to partner with google.org to, to progress your work in the area, how is that possible? Excellent question. We love when people want to uh, work with google.org. So uh, in terms of advancing research around cash transfers, we are currently uh, working with JPAL team. So uh, Margaret and, and Lisa who are, and Simon who are representing JPAL here today are our key partners um, around this work uh, and advancing this and also the Give Directly team in, in Kenya uh, who do the implementation as Tamilori uh, described in, in detail earlier. So um, I think either JPAL or, or Give Directly teams on the ground would perhaps would be the best, uh, the quickest way forward. However, um, I'm Tamilori and I will be happy to learn more about uh, the projects. And I'm sure after this meeting, there'll be some form of exchange of, of contact details. And you know, we're, uh, we're always looking for innovative ideas and, and ways to support local organizations. So it will be great to stay in touch. Thank you very much, Lisa, for that question, for that answer. The next question I'm going to pose it to Jacqueline. Jacqueline, did you conduct any training to women enterprises? And if you did, and if you did, what kind of training? And did you, by any chance, do anything to do with e-commerce? Thank you, Joy, for the question. So, for this particular group, we had not conducted the training. The previous study was on mentoring, where we were matching a mentor and a mentee to see the effects of being mentored in your business. So, it was supposed to be organic, like you spend time with somebody who's more experienced. So that was the original baseline. So for this study, we did not have any training and we did not use uh, the soccer watch. Yeah. Thank you very much. The next uh, question is uh, addressed to, to White. And, uh, uh, and the question is, uh, White discussed heterogeneity of financial behavior across perception of COVID did, sorry, the question is, is actually um, addressed to Tami. Did Tami and other Google.org team see similar behavior? That is, did you see uh, heterogeneity, heter any heterogeneity of financial services behavior across the perception of COVID risk? Tami? Yes, on this particular question, we aren't really evaluating their like, COVID awareness or what the perception of the risks are. We're more tr we're tracking more of their financial and behavior, their spending, what they're spending the funding on. So I can't speak to you know White's um, and Jacqueline's highlights around the fact that some of them didn't believe that there was COVID or had different ranges of belief of how um, how lethal and close it was or it is. So I can't speak to that specifically in terms of this particular project. Um, it's we just kind of we're focusing more on. What they're spending the funding on and how they you know what the uptake of the training is and how they're able to invest those skills in other income generating projects and activities thank you so much that's uh we're almost at time so i'm, I'm sorry if you not answer all questions there were very many interesting questions i would have loved to pose all of them but uh we we have to stop there and i would like to invite margaret to to say any logistical issues that, that she may want to field Margaret, please, and you may thank you. close for us. Thank you so much, Joy, and thank you to Jacqueline, Wyatt, Lisa, and Tamalori for being really interesting panelists today. I think I certainly learned a lot about all of your work. Thank you also to the JPAL teams on the call, to uh, most importantly, all of the audience members who made this such a compelling discussion and Q&A. 
Um, to just sort of wrap up with logistics, we'll be sending out a recap email after this event to all those who registered, which will have access to the recording and we'll also be placing the recording on the event page. Um, again, I just wanna say a huge thank you to everyone for taking the time to join us today uh, and looking forward to, to carrying forward the conversation. Um, as always, please feel free to reach out to me. You can find my information um, on JPAL's website if you have any additional follow-up questions. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day.